Certainly good to see you today. We're going to be continuing a message here in just a moment on restoring your zeal that we started about last week and winning the battle with discouragement in our life. But before I get there, at the end of the service today, hopefully, if everything works out, there'll be a, a one more video in regard to our vacation Bible school. But I want to say something about it personally because it's such an important ministry that we carry out here at Believer's Fellowship. One of the many ministries in regard to our children. You know, you'd be surprised how many people I've met over the years and 37, 38 years of ministry and just... Did, Talked to about how they met the Lord and when they met the Lord, how many of them have come back and said, you know, I was just a kid in vacation Bible school when I gave my life to Christ. Uh, some of you are here perhaps that met the Lord in a children's camp or a children's vacation Bible school. You know how important and how impactful that they can be. But to make those successful as we want them to be, it takes people, it takes uh, adults, it takes young people who want to come and give some time. It may be you haven't signed up and say, I want to participate yet because you think I could only come a day or two. Hey, if you can come a day or two, you let us know. We need your help. Uh, if you can come for the whole four days that it is, we need your help. It's just a great, great ministry. Uh, you'll be blessed. Lives will be changed and uh, you'll be laying up rewards in heaven which cannot be duplicated in any other place. So I want to encourage you, if there's any way possible you can help with Vacation Bible School this year, be sure and let Gary Sophie Juarez know the information's in the bulletin. Uh, they'll be registering Vacation Bible School stuff starting this weekend, so uh, you can uh, sign up out there, grab one of them, say, hey, I want to be a part of working with the kids this year in Vacation Bible School. We have a place for you. And you say, well, I can't teach. That's fine. we still got a place for you uh, to come and serve and be a part of having a powerful impact in the lives of the little people. Amen? It's a great, great ministry. I do want to continue this message today as we've been dealing with, starting with last week, on restoring your zeal for Christ and winning the battle with discouragement. Uh, it's, it's, it's the thing that, if you weren't here last week, that we said was probably one of the most important things that we can add as an element to our Christian walk in life is that the whole thing of zeal. It's the missing ingredient for so many Christians today. It's like, you know, Jesus uh, uh, gave us a demonstration of that in one very clear sense, and the disciples made reference to the passion that Jesus had when he was in the temple turning over the tables and running out the money changers. And we talked about that a lot last week, or a little bit last week, so not, I won't go into that, but you see in Jesus as he goes into his father's house, which is intended to be a house of prayer. He has a passion for this place. He has a passion for the people come and have a meeting with God. Now, for us, we know that meeting place is now that we are the, the living temple individually. But by the way, we're also collectively the living temple. The Bible says we are living stones. So as we come together, we are that place. Jesus might not come in here and run out the table, turn over the tables for money changers. We don't have any. But I certainly think that when he comes to see the church today, there's a lot of things that are disappointing to him. And in his zeal and his passion, there would be some things made known real quickly. He is a man of zeal. He's a man of passion. Disciples recognized that, and they gave reference to this passage in Psalms where it talked about they remembered that it was written, the zeal of the house has eaten me up or has consumed me. Psalm 69, 9 is the passage wherein that comes from. That Jesus had passion. What we need as believers is a renewal of that kind of passion, that kind of unction that drives us to love God and drives us to serve God and drives us to, with a fresh, hungry desire to be passionate, for lack of better words, passionate for the things of God. Another translation reads it this way, enthusiasm. In fact, the word enthusiasm comes from the old Latin term where we get entheo, which means in God. So genuine passion, genuine enthusiasm really comes from a relationship with the Lord. Another passage puts it this way, my zeal for God and his work burn hot within me. That's what we need. I think it's what Revelation, uh, John was talking about in the book of Revelation when he's rebuking the church there and he says, you know, you left your first love. I think that first love is what we're talking about. And one of the things that obviously robs us of that is we get into the world we're living in. The Bible says because sin abounds, the, the love of many will wax cold. People have a tendency to let their love and their passion wax over because the world that we live in, they get their eyes on the wrong things or they get their eyes turned inward and they miss it. There's another uh, messianic passage in the Old Testament in Isaiah talking in reference to Jesus in the future. He put on righteousness like a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and he wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. Zeal, passion, unction, do you have that in your heart? Is there anything that seems to keep you motivated and keeps you driving and keeps you hungry and keeps you unctionized for the, for the things of God and for the will of God in your own life? It is used in the Bible most often. It's dealing with this word zeal, passions. 
Strong feelings, and sometimes good, sometimes bad. The Greek word is the word zealous. We get the word, you know, being zealous for something. And it's used for a state of, of a passionate committal or something within that seems to motivate you and push you and, and, and drive you. The classical Greek word from which this comes from is this word that had to do with a warlike spirit. Soldiers who would run to the battle with a passion, with a, with a burning hot passion to, to, to make war and stand for what's right and to stand for good. And it literally has to do with making something, you know, a goal, making something a, a, the aim a, that I would strive after it. I think this is the whole context of what the Apostle Paul meant when he says, you know, he said, I have this one driving passion that I might be found in him, be conformed to him. You know, the, to pursue the high calling of Christ Jesus, that's, that's the driving force. Now, the focus of zeal most often, as you look up in the Scriptures, has to do with the house of God, the will of God, the things of God. Last week, we got into this message, and we started talking about one specific individual, David, in the Old Testament, because he, he really is a, a perfect picture of this kind of passion. You see him when he goes up to the front lines, and there's Goliath, who's taunting the armies of God. He says, who is this? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who mocks or taunts the armies of the living God? There's a bit of indignation there. But at the same time, a passion. I, you know, I, well, let me take care of this problem. Let me deal with this issue. That's what it gets to. It's not only that we would be indignant about something, we want to do what needs to be done. We want to do what's right. We have a, we have a driving force. We have this motivation within us. To, I want to see God's will done. And Paul, it says in the book of Acts, walked through the city of Athens and his, his spirit, it says, was moved within him. I think that's what we're talking about here. Something that burns within me. He said, well, I, I see sin. And it's not just being indignant about the things that are wrong in our culture and the world we live in, but he said, I want to do something about it. That's the zeal that's missing. That's the zeal and that's the passion that should be driving us. And we see that in David because you, you follow his testimony, you follow his story. But at the same time, you know, uh, is he had this warlike spirit and he had this passion, obviously, for building the house of God. You know the story about Solomon who built it. That was David's son. But David provided financing and monies and timber and all the things that would be needed to build that house. First Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 4, David is also, at that point, a picture of a man who's lost his zeal. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 4, I don't have those verses up. You can open to them in your Bible. We looked at them last week. We'll make a reference to a couple of those ending verses out of 1 Samuel today. But when you get in there, you see, here's this guy who's just a great picture of zeal and passion and, and burning fire for God, who had a heart, you know, that God loved. He had man after God's own heart, the scripture says. But then you see him also at his low points. There are points of failure, there are points of defeat in his life. And this is one of those low points. And it really gets kind of apexes in his life. When he's running from King Saul, remember he'd slain the giant, Saul welcomes him into the palace and embraces him as a, as a family member, but then he begins to get jealous of David because David's popularity began to rule. So he, he reaches out on a couple of occasions and tries to kill David. And then in 1 Samuel 27, a couple of chapters before 30 there, David is looking out over a precipice where Saul is going to bed at night with his soldiers. They've been out hunting for David to take him prisoner, most likely to kill him. And they settle down for a night at camp with their guards, and they put Saul in the middle of the encampment. And the Bible says and describes to us in those chapters how that all his men were camped around him in a circle, Saul in the center. David goes down with his servant, <coughs> excuse me, into the midst of the camp. And when he gets down there, he gets past the guards and past the troop, and he's standing there with his servant at the head of King Saul. And of course, his servant says, let me take this spear. It was in the ground beside Saul's head. It was Saul's spear. Let me take his spear, run it through his head, and we'll be done with this deal. So I'll only strike him once. I won't hit him twice. I know how you feel about this. Saul, you know, he loved, you know, David loved Saul. And he, he knew that God's hand was on Saul for that period of time. He also knew God had called him. But it was in God's time, in God's place, that he would ascend to be king. It wasn't now. It could have been. But he, he stopped his servant and says, no, I shall not touch God's anointed. And he said that to him twice. And so they snuck back out of the camp, later woke them up, showed a piece of the garment and told, showed Saul how he could have killed him but didn't kill him. Saul kind of goes through this pseudo repentance that he's gone, oh, I'm so sorry. Come on down. I'll welcome you back. And David knows better. But in Psalms, in, in 1 Samuel 27, just following that story, it says, and David said in his heart, 
I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than I should speedily escape in the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me anymore on any of the coast of, of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. This is the low point. This is the bottom of the pit, all right? This is where it just gets so deep. You know, the hole's been dug, and you're in the bottom of the hole, and he just says, what's the use? What's the use? You know, if I stay here, I'm going to die. There's nothing better for me. I will perish. There's no hope. Have you ever been there, by the way? At wit's end, in the hole, in the pit, think there's no way. This is that time when David wrote those psalms in, 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 in Psalm 10 and Psalm 13, that little section of psalms there. He says, why are you standing far off? God, have you forgot? How long are you for forever? Are you going to forget me forever? You read those psalms of just despair. This is where he's at. He's in a place of absolute despair and discouragement. And every Christian comes to this place different points in their life. We all come to this. And even if you're not a Christian, you come to these places in your life. You say, what's the use? I don't know if I can deal with this anymore. I don't, I, I, I've had it here. I can't, I can't take anymore. You know, I've got to do something. And David says, I've got to do something. And so, and so what he does is he runs. And he takes flight and he leaves the land of Israel and he goes to the Philistines and he joins forces with a king of Kish, who basically named me Snake Handler. He goes and joins forces with this serpent and he goes to Gath, which was the land of Goliath, where Goliath comes from. Of all the people in the world to join your hands with, you wouldn't think it'd be him. But this, we do stupid things. When we start running, when we say, it's, it's, it's really hopeless, God's kind of forgotten me, and so I'm going to take these, these matters into my own hands. I'll deal with this myself because God apparently doesn't, not interested. Or whatever it might be. And we get to those discouraging points and those discouraging places in our life where we just kind of say, what's the use? I shall perish. I, and the Lord literally means I'll be destroyed. I'll, I'll, I'll be consumed. I'll be scattered. There's nothing left. Life's over. This is the end. I can't do, and unfortunately, when the world gets to this place, they really don't have any other recourse, do they? Some will pursue, you know, just keep running. Some pers just get out, bail out of relationships. They bail out of responsibilities. They walk away from jobs. They, they pursue uh, drugs or alcohol or suicide. There's just all kinds of, of wrong decisions that people have a tendency to make in these times. And as a Christian, we don't have to make those kind of decisions. Many times we will, but like David, even though we run, it's really not all over. Now, for David, he's in the bottom of the pit, and he's still digging holes, all right? You ever been there? The rule number one is we need to get to the bottom of the pit, quit digging. So he's not. He's not through digging. He decides one day, as he befriends King Achish, that he's going to go to battle against Saul and his countrymen. And so he joins Achish to go to the front line where all the other Philistine kings are. And he meets up there with those guys, and they see David coming. And they turn to the king of Gath and say, Are you out of your mind? Isn't that David? Isn't that he, he killed your top warrior? And you think we can trust him in battle against Saul? I'm sure Kish, well, you know, Saul's a bad guy. He ran him out of the country, time to kill him, you know, yada, yada, yada. They weren't having it. They said, no way. He's not going to join forces with us. What is to stop him? That if we get in the middle of the heat of the battle and he starts seeing his brothers slain and fall in battle, what's to keep him from changing his mind? What's to keep him from reversing his course and then killing all of us? He's not going with us. So David is rejected, not only by Saul, by many of his own people. Now he's rejected by the Philistines. And he kind of gets on his horse with his 600 men or so, and they're heading back to this encampment that they've had called Ziklag. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30, you see this, this, what happens next. When you don't think it could get any worse, it gets worse. When you think you're at the bottom, the bottom falls out. When you think it's hopeless, it looks like absolute despair. Now there is no hope whatsoever. Because as he goes back to where they've been camping out, the company of men that had had their families there and their supplies there and their little encampment there, they get back and it's burned with fire. We read this last week. It's smoldering with ashes. All the women, the wives, the children, all the store, all the material wealth has been carried off captive by the Amalekites. By the way, the Amalekites had been the brunt of the other end of that deal because David had been going down to that part of the Philistine nations and pillaging them for his supplies. And so when he's gone up to battle, I guess somebody has a little spy work and says, hey, David and his men are gone, let's go get some stuff. And they carry everything out. 
And it, it reads like this in 1 Samuel 30, that when they got back to the camp, everybody wept till they could weep no more. There's just no more tears to cry. There's no more weeping convulsions to come. They were run out of tears. And it says, to the point now that they even spoke of stoning David. In chapter 30, verse 6 of that passage, it goes to the point to say, well, and David turned to the Lord and encouraged himself in the Lord and began to pray. Now, we covered most of that last week, and I want to throw in one little thing here, though, folks, about discouragement. We all deal with it, and it comes usually at pretty obvious times that we're not even ready for it, and, but we should be ready for it. We should have enough wisdom to see that, that what we're going through and experiencing. One time it usually comes, it's usually just before something's good. That's why the Bible says, you know, you, you don't faint. Don't pass out. Don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap. In other words, don't give up the hope. Don't, don't, don't bail out. Don't stop. Hang in there when you think it's not going to happen. God's got something for you. The other time discouragement comes is usually on the heels of some great event in our life. Something good just happens, and we're all excited. The adrenaline's pumped up. We're all pumped up. We're ready. We're excited. Elijah, remember, Mount Carmel, the fire falls. He kills all the false prophets, runs back to Jerusalem, outruns Ahab, who's in his chariot, he outruns him on foot back to the city where he hears a bad report given by Jezebel. I'm going to do to Elijah what he did to my prophets before tomorrow comes. And it says, when Elijah heard that, he ran for his life. And it says he went about, about 18 miles out in the wilderness, and he's sitting under a juniper tree, a little broom bush. And he's saying, okay, Lord, what's my life? You, you know, I'm not any better than my brothers. Go ahead and kill me. Maybe you prayed that prayer. God, you'd be better if I just did. Maybe the rapture could happen today. Just get me out of here. I can't take this anymore. And by the way, the Lord never answered Elijah's prayer ever. He just took him out without dying, remember? <laughs> but he did restore him. And you follow his journey of discouragement and despair. It is so similar to where David's been and where any of us can go if we're not careful and we don't realize these vulnerable points in our life. It, Satan does not want us to have a victory, and he does, certainly doesn't want us to enjoy the victory or enjoy the celebration. I, I learned this particular principle a long time ago when we do revivals, and we'd be on the road, and we see God do some great things in a church, and a lot of people get saved, and the church just kind of turned upside down for Jesus and be heading home. It seemed within a matter of 36 hours, some, some th something would happen, trying to knock the wind out of yourselves, trying to level you before you could go any further. So we need to be cautious of these events in our life. And realize that, hey, there are cycles that we go through, the world we live in, and there are tactics of our enemy that we must be aware of. Paul said we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. So these are some things that we need to, to learn and to understand. We talked last week how David lost his vision, his passion, his purpose. Kind of like dominoes. When you start losing your perception of God and his promises and what he said for you, then you start looking down and you start losing your, your enthusiasm and your zeal. And when that goes, you just lost all sense of direction and you lose your purpose. I want to give you quickly today and wrap this sermon up with five quick points. If you can just get these in your heart and mind, that when discouragement comes, even when you feel like you are at the bottom of the bottom, and you may be there today, all right? This may be right where you are. If not, there's going to come some times in your life when you experience these things. We live in a corrupt, sinful world. Don't blame God for it, amen. You know, if you don't blame somebody, just blame, the, blame Adam and Eve and ourselves. We're all responsible for the sin that's in this corrupt culture we live in. It's coming a day when Jesus will be the king. Things are going to change, all right? But understand that there will be times of discouragement. How do you, how do you deal with those times and what do you do? First, you know, you, you look what David said in 1 Samuel 30 where it says, and David did several things. You, first of all, you take it to the Lord. You got to take it to Jesus. You got you to turn to Christ and you, you have to come to the place of just saying, Lord, I don't have any other place to go but you. Now, that's not a bad deal. Some people think, oh, I've got to turn to God. I didn't want to get to this place. And they spend their life trying to twist and scheme and, and not come to that place of responsibility before God. They, you know, it's like if that's the bad and that's the work. That's the best. Some of you people running toward hell like it was heaven, amen, running toward the devil like he was God. Change course. Take it to Jesus. I tell you, over recent days, some of you know that some of the deal that our family's been through, and this has been an, a theme song in so many regards. It's an old hymn. It says, I must tell Jesus. Maybe you remember it. You just don't know what to do. The old song said, I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, 
He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. And of course, when I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear these burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Praise the Lord. We got ourselves into it, but we don't have to get ourselves out of it. <laughs> that we have a God who loves us and who cares for us, who's concerned about us, and we can tell Jesus all of our sorrows and all of our problems. Another verse of that says, Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. But I must tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, and you may be in a situation today, you say, you know, I don't know what to do in my situation. I would say first and foremost, you take it to the Lord Jesus. He's not going to reject you. He's not going to turn you away. That spirit of condemnation and accusation, and that stuff that goes on in our minds says, you're so sorry, you messed up, you blew it, you're mad, you know, you're not going to get, that's not from God. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All the sin, you did it, yes, and you are wrong, yes, but it's all been paid for. That's why you can go to Jesus. He's the one who paid for it. And he is ever interceding at the Father's side. And the Holy Spirit who lives in you, the Bible says, groans through you to pray those prayers on your behalf. We can tell the Lord. So brokenness is a valuable thing in the sight of God. He loves a broken and a contrite heart because that's the heart he can work with. The Bible says a wounded spirit who can bear. And maybe that's where you are. You need to let that woundedness turn into brokenness and contrition. Say, God, I have no other place to go. I'm coming to you. Come unto me, all you that labor. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden. I will give you rest. So why don't you quit wringing your hands and worrying yourself and considering everything despairingly without hope. Take it to Jesus. The next part is very important, though. You do need to remove the guilt. If there is sin involved, if there's a failure involved, something you did, all right, there's some things God will allow in our lives. We still take it to Jesus. But if there's something we invited because of our disobedience, Confess it. Ask God to forgive you. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9 that God is faithful and God is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have a God who stands ready today to hear your confession and liberate your heart, forgive that sin, cleanse you completely. You say, but you don't know what I did. You don't know how big it was. No, perhaps you don't remember what he did or how big he is. But what he did is bigger and more powerful than what you did, no matter how horrible you did, whatever it was. He's greater still. Somebody ought to say amen and praise the Lord. Maybe you're still in shock over the fact of just saying, well, he is bigger. I don't know. But we need to realize I can remove the guilt and the condemnation and be cleansed before God. The third thing is take up the shield of faith. The Bible talks about that, 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 that helmet of salvation, the breastplate, our loins girded with truth, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, but it also talks about the shield of faith. And there is a point Satan's doing everything he can in every one of our lives to get us to keep just lowering that shield and lowering it till we're so discouraged we just can't lift it up anymore. But what you need to do, you need to realize his favorite attack is always lies. And he lies to you. There's no hope, he says. The Bible says that God is the God of all hope. There's just no way here. Jesus said, I am the way. There's no answer. He is the eternal I am, which means he am the answer for every question, every dilemma, every problem, every failure, every discouragement, and every defeat. He is. And you can go to him, and you can take up the shield. Satan comes, on the other hand, the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He says stuff to you like this. Well, God's left you. And you say, God's left me. You say, whatever he says, that's not lifting up the shield of faith. How do I lift up the shield of faith? I say what God says. And God says... Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. I will never forsake you. So to lift up the shield of faith means quit repeating what the devil says and agree with what God says. That's to take up the shield. But, Brother Joe, no good can come from this. 
But sister, whoever you are and brother, whoever you are, my God says to us that all things work together for good to them who love him. Somebody amen again. It's the truth. But brother Joe, people have hurt me. They do that. <laughs> they do that. But God says, that's not your problem. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high places. Your enemy's not in the house with you. Your enemy's a spiritual enemy, and he hates you. And so you need to direct your battle, not against others, but against the devil. That's lifting up the shield of faith. And as Satan comes with his accusations and his lies, they're like fiery arrows that are quenched in the context of truth. They're swallowed up in it. Take up the shield of faith. The fourth point do what David did. Encourage yourself in the Lord. This is an interesting word in the Hebrew language, quazak. And it literally means to fasten yourself onto something, to embrace something, to be established or to fortify yourself in some regard. It's translated like this in different ways. One, be established, fasten, force, fortify, to make hard, to harden, to help, to play the man, which we would say man up in the Lord. In the Lord, not in yourself, but in Christ. It literally means be strong. Isn't that what the scripture says? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Let me quote that in another version. Be weak in yourself and in the power of your might. But you can be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Verse 8 of 1 Samuel 30 says, And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue? What's he doing? He's encouraging himself. That's what the one translation says. He encourages himself. The greatest source of encouragement is going to be God and his word and his promises to you. You can't disregard him. You can't close this book during these kind of times. You have to go to him. You have to look him in heart and eye and take his word in hand and say, God, what you said is true. And I believe you said you'd never leave me. So I don't care what I feel like. You're here. God, you said you'd forgive me. And I know what I did was bad. But you said Jesus died for that. And I thank you. And you just start encouraging yourself and what God said, agreeing with him, not agreeing with the enemy, but agreeing with what God has said. That is to encourage yourself in the Lord. That is to play the man. That is to, the Bible says in one place, behave yourself valiantly. Be what God's called you to be. Take your stand. Rise to the occasion. You are the overcomer, not the enemy. The fifth thing in regard to this is this word pursue. He said, Lord, what do I do? That's a good question to ask when you're in the bottom of the pit. Lord says, quit digging. <laughs> crawl out of there Lord they took my wives and they took my goods and they took the children and everybody's children everybody wants to kill me by the way that is a <clears throat> a real issue you have to deal with if you're going to be in leadership anyway anywhere there will be times when everybody will speak of stoning you there will come times of absolute discouragement and the old thing Ronald Reagan said the buck stops here There'll be times, maybe on your job, maybe in your household, it, it, but somewhere, if you're in some form of leadership, there's going to come times when you, you, you know, everybody's looking for the fall guy. The best thing you can do is be the guy that falls before the Lord and trust him and encourage yourself in him and listen to what he has to say. You put everything in the hands of a mighty God and in faith at that point, whatever he says to do, that's what you do. You stand, you pray, you move forward, you believe, you act in whatever way that God wants you to do. Psalms 30, verses 18, 19. The Lord said, shall I do it? And the Lord said, David, you go recover all. And the Bible says, and David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small, nor great, nor sons, nor daughter, nor spoils, nor anything that they had taken to them. What are the last three words? David. Say it again. David recovered all. Now, the Lord tells him in verse 17, go recover all. In verses 18, 19, twice it says it, David recovered all. It says it once, David recovered all. We got it. But just in case we didn't get it, the Lord closes that with David recovered all. But this takes, this takes a point of our own, you know, it's one thing to say God will do something, but God wants to use you in the process of doing it. So you have to step out and you have to pursue and you have to do and go and be what God's called you to do. Now, the devil had celebrated probably his victory his, and the defeat of David in this whole thing. 
And he's out stomping around the smoke and the ashes of Ziklag. David's out over here. Everybody wants to stone him, but David's not giving up here. He's asking God what he wants to do. And the same thing comes true for you today. Perhaps you smell the smoldering ruin of some crisis in your life. You can't sit there and just be giving into it all and say there's no hope here. You have to take a step of faith. You have to choose to believe God. You have to say, I'm going to raise my sword and I'm going to raise my shield. And I'm not going down without a fight. And I realize who my enemy is, but I realize who is my strong and mighty tower, and I'm looking to him. And if God says I can recover, I'm recovering. And I'll recover everything that the Lord has for me. I just know that God's faithful, folks. There's just no way that God is going to abandon us. Because God's word says he will not abandon us. So we must be cautious that we don't do what David did and seek to abandon God. And God's will, and God's place, or God's purpose for our lives. Recover all. How do we do that? David encouraged himself in the Lord. What do you want me to do, Lord? I don't know how that process went. I don't know if David got off in the corner and just started, first of all, I believe in brokenness, confessing where all the failures were and what his own bad decisions were in that process. I think somewhere it poured on into brokenness before God that accepted God's grace. Yes, thank you, Lord. And began to worship and to praise God. And then to take that dilemma before God and put it in his hands and say, I don't know what to do. Like King Jehoshaphat, when the word came in from his, all his military commanders that in the night all the Philistines had surrounded the city and they, were, they had all banded together with one goal, and that's to destroy the city and the king. And they were outnumbered hundreds to one. And Jehoshaphat stood when he heard the news and tore his garment before God and in brokenness said, we don't know what to do, but our eye is on you. If that's where you are today, don't run from it. In the future, when you come to some situation, I believe that God's a big enough God to whisper these words back into your ears, what this message in the heart of this message is. Then embrace it and move forward. Take your stand and pursue and keep pursuing. We are not a people who are supposed to be stagnant anyway. We're to always be moving forward. Would you stand with your heads bowed? I would say this very clearly to you today, that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you really don't have a...